So what happened uh, last week, I was uh, asked to sub um, for a bowling, in a bowling league. It's a, it's a really good bowling league. I was asked to sub in it. And uh, anyway, we were getting going, and there was this guy that was on our pair of lanes. He was on the other team. He was on our pair. And I really liked this guy. Um, I'd say he's probably 30 years old. I don't really know a lot about him. But um, he and his wife and his two little kids bowled with Linda and I um, in the summer, you know, mixed league which for, with children, you know, and, and we had a blast. And I really liked him, really nice guy, really liked him a lot. So he shows up, though, Friday night, and um, he's late, which is really unusual, and he, um, he wasn't like himself. He was, he was not in a good mood, and I said something to him, you know, I said hi, and he, like, grunted, and then I said, hey, you know, what happened to your smile or something, you know, because I'm always fooling around with him, you know, and it, there was no answer. So I'm like, hmm. Not a good night for uh, what's his name. So, so uh, maybe you know, maybe four or five frames later, as we're getting into it, he um, wasn't bowling that great, and um, so he comes as he's walking up from the back toward the bowling alley. And there's a there's a, a a shelving thing for the bowling balls. He slams it. When I say slams, he's like a truck driving guy. You know, he's got you know muscles that I just dream about, and he. Um, <laughs> He slammed this thing. I don't know how he didn't break it. And then he got down the steps to the bench seats, and he slammed the bench seats as he's walking up. And one of the older guys on the next pair over said, hey, you know, what's your problem? And he turned around, and he's right in front of me. I'm like on the end of the bench facing the lane. He's right in front of me, and he turned around and started telling this guy, if you want trouble, you know, you're, you come to the right place, so I'll, I'll give you trouble. And I'm like, this guy is a really nice guy. I don't understand why he's even talking like this, you know? So, so um, the other guy just said, hey, you know, I'm just telling you not to hit things. He goes, I'm warning you. Last time I'm warning you, you know? So then he, he gets up and he takes a shot. It's a terrible shot. And um, it's really shot for a bad shot for a good, really good bowler. And um, he knocked down like three pins. Everybody here can do it. You can do that, right, Heather? You can knock down three. <laughs> and, um, and he knocked down like three pins. And so he came back. Now the, the bowling alley has like a thing like, like this big with the computer on it for the scoring, and um, I don't know what they're worth, probably 1,000 or so, and he came back and he, bam, and he hits this thing so hard, I don't really know how it didn't fall over and break. Just, it just really hit hard, and like I said, I am sitting right here, and bam, I'm like, now I'm back a little bit. I've had enough surgery. I don't need to get in the middle of, you know, anybody that's strong like that, and a guy from about three lanes over that I know, um, he's a really nice guy, but he stands up, and he's like trying to protect the guy at the bowling alley, because he's like too soft-spoken and too gentle, and so he stands up and says, hey, you got to stop knocking on this guy's equipment. You're going to break something, you know. And this guy turned around and said, if you're looking, long story short, he went at him. And I just got out of the way in time, and he went at him, and it took five guys to hold him down, and they had him on the floor for about 20 or 30 minutes. And um, I thought to myself, if they had a taser, I'm not sure he would have felt it. I don't know what was going on, but it was... It was really bad, and everybody's mood was broken. And, and um, so anyway, that kind of sat on my heart this week. And um, it sat there because I'm, th I'm sitting there, what is wrong with our society today that relationships are getting worse and worse and worse? Like, like if you would think if there's anything that we could have learned over the last 10,000 years... It would be how to get along with one another, right? Because we've had a lot of practice, right? Right, honey? 43 years in, in a couple of weeks for us. We're still working on it. Did I look a dis little disdain there? Yeah, we're still working on it. It's hard sometimes, but it's, it's relationships that we should have a grasp on, and yet we don't seem to have it. And, and when I look, when some, somebody actually said to me this week, I literally said to me, well, why... Church. Why do you need church? Like, like, what do you really need it for? And if you really seriously answer that question, what, what is your answer to, to someone who says, why do you go to church? Well, if you believe in God, you should go to church. That's kind of a really lousy answer. It's really not a very good answer. I want to give you better answers to that question today. Because in our society today, you've got colleges and universities, the Internet and Google, and if you want to know something like how to get along with other people. You should have anywhere you need to go to do that, right? I mean, there's really, you know, it's like, right, my, my headlight went on my truck last week. 
can, pulled out my phone. I Googled how to replace a headlight on a Silverado. YouTube showed me how. Boom, boom, boom. Why do we need church if we have all this information available to us everywhere else? And yet, we like, we fail so bad in church also at relationships. It's really, the, the, the question is a very interesting one. I read something funny this week. It's, it's not me. I read it. It was in the Socrates Times. It was really, really funny. The guy talked about how the fact that you have to get a license in this country to do just about anything you want to do. You want to go fishing? You've got to have a fishing license. You want to go hunting? You've got to have a hunting license. They don't just give you a hunting license. If you want to go hunting, you have to take a hunting course. And it's involved. It's quite an involved course, isn't it, John? If you, if you want to go fishing, you know, you have to know the rules. You have to take a test. If you want to get a driver's license, you get a driver's test, right? The written test. And, and then there's the road test. But if you want to get married, <laughs> you fill out a form. And you pay them 20 bucks, and they stamp it. It's all that's required. Why is that? Because nobody gets hurt in marriage? Like if you're hunting, you could kill somebody, right? Nobody gets hurt in marriage? Wrong. Man, there are zillions of people that are hurt and damaged. We meet them all the time. Why is that? It's really, really funny. I think that, I think that if you want to get married, um, you, should, you should take, you know, in driver's license, you also have to take an eye test, right? So you've got to be able to see in order to drive, right? Can you imagine in marriage taking a written test before we get married? Okay, who's going to be taking out the garbage? You know, some, a lot of people, they don't know the answer to that question until after it's too late, you know? What is marriage all about? I don't know. We're just, I love her, she loves me, we're getting married, you know? How does it work? Are there different personalities involved? Oh, boy. <laughs> what language does your, other, your partner speak? Okay, we know it's English, but no, really, what language do they speak? Because I'm still learning Linda's language. I've got, got a couple examples for you that. And can you imagine taking your road test for marriage? Here's, my, here's the, this guy suggested that you take two young people, get four young children, and a puppy from a family who needs to take a week off and put them in a trailer for a week. See how they do. And if they pass the test, then they should be able to get married. What do we do? Here's a license. Go ahead. Go for it. See what happens. And it gets worse because the one thing that could have helped us in relationships is God's principles that he laid out in his word. And our culture is turning its back on them. We don't pay any attention to those things anymore. We don't pay any attention to what love really means and, and, and all the stuff that goes along with that. I was, um, I was waiting for Linda one day. That's a pastime of mine, waiting for Linda. And um, one of the things I have in my list of... of um, if you, anytime you want to rebuttal, yeah. I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> one, um, one of the... One of the things I learned about Linda is when, I, when we're going somewhere and I say, how long? When are you going to be ready? Okay? And if she says two minutes, I have, a, I have a note for that. It's on a notepad. I go to Linda's language. And in case I forget, two minutes equals 20. Okay? So, okay. okay. So I got 20 minutes. So I, I rarely, if ever, watch TV. So I sit down, and, and I'm waiting for lunch, and there's some girls talk show on. I don't know what it was. And there was like a panel of women, and one of the girls said, well, what do you think about ghosting? And, and fortunately, I actually felt a little bit better because one of the girls on the panel didn't know what ghosting was. She thought that some kind of like haunted house or something, you know. And so the other girls had to explain to her that ghosting means that you no longer want to have a relationship with somebody. You no longer want to talk to them. You don't text. You don't Facebook. You don't, you don't do anything. You don't answer the phone. You just, you're just not there anymore. And they wanted to know about ghosting, you know. And, and, and I was relieved to hear this one woman say, you know, it's really an easy way out to ghost. She goes, but it's not right. She said, because... 
the other person deserves to know why you don't want to talk to them. And maybe you need to work through why you don't want to talk to them. And I'm like, wow, this person's actually mature. <laughs> There's actually a talk show where they actually have people on there that are mature. Of course, there was other gals on the show that totally debunked her. and saying, But here's, here's, the, here's the history of this problem, is that God put Adam and Eve in the garden. He made Adam and then he made Eve, and Eve was gorgeous. And Adam knew that. He said, wow, she's flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She's beautiful. She's different. Wow, is she different? Because I have no idea what she's talking about. That's really what's going on. And if they'd stayed in the garden, God would have taught Adam and Eve how to talk to one another. But they didn't. Now they're out there. Now they're out there. Think about this historically. Up until very, and, and when you take the, the entire history, up until very recent history, man has ruled over women. In many cultures, he just rules over them. They're like slaves to them. Why is that? Because we have no idea how to live with you. <laughs> we have no idea how to live with you. So we want what we want whenever we want it. So we rule over you because we don't get it. We don't understand you. So God comes along and he says, here's the prophets, here's Paul. Let me teach you how to live with this woman. And so Paul says in the word, he says, husbands, love your wives. Why does he say that? Because we don't love our wives. We just want what we want whenever we want it. Okay? And then he said to the wives, respect your husbands. Wives have a lot much easier time loving their man. What they have trouble with is respecting them. Just last week, Ian is standing on the edge of my swimming pool. Linda's in the water. I don't know what it is, but I grew up, and anybody standing on the edge of the pool needs to be shoved in. <laughs> so I just walked up to him, shoved him in the water. Well, apparently, Ian's never had his head underwater before. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I mean, my brother shoved me in earlier age than that, and I learned how to swim, you know what I mean? But he didn't. So, so he go, falls in the pool. He's coming up screaming. Linda grabs him, and she gave me that look like, you idiot. <laughs> so she, she loves me, but she's having trouble respecting me because I act like a 12-year-old. <laughs> Is that not true, women? Perfectly true. God... God knows. We don't grow up. We don't grow up. So he says women, respect them. They're idiots, but you've got to respect them. <laughs> Husbands, you've got to love them. You've got to think about their needs over your own. That's what love's all about. He had to teach us. He had to teach us. What do you mean? He, in the, in, and you know what he does? You know what he provided to teach us all of these things? You know what he provided for us? Each other. He provided for each other. He provided the church. Adam said, it's my family. It's not just my friends or a party. This is my family. That's what he does. Because in the Bible, he says in the church, he goes, I want you to love one another. I want you to serve one another. I want you to pray for one another. I want you to encourage one another. I want you to bless one another. Look up the words one another in any, um, thank you, concordance, and you'll see 50 scriptures in the New Testament, on what you should do to one another. And most of the time, what we do is ghost one another. I am sick and tired of talking to that person. I just don't want to do it anymore. And we fail at it. See, people stop coming to church because they run into problems at church. I don't like that person. And he said something to me, and that person did this, and that person did this. And we run into these problems. And so, and so we stop going to church because we think that church is a place for rest and, and for refuge and, and joy and peace. Actually, the Bible never says that. He said, he said, you will find refuge in the presence of the Lord your God. You will find refuge in the presence of your Lord your God. But he said, but when you're hanging out with each other, he says, iron sharpens iron. I'm going to sharpen you. You're going to sharpen me. 
It's just that simple. That's what this is all about. It's a learning place for us. God will specifically hold himself back from revealing himself to you if you isolate yourself. Because he wants to use other people in church to speak to you. I have found him specifically holding back, said, you want to know the answer to this, you go talk to so-and-so. I don't like so-and-so. That's where your answer is. He does it. He reveals himself through others. You want to ghost it? You want to go alone? You, you, you want to just, just me and Jesus? You better think about it again. And actually, think about it historically. Isolation has always been a form of punishment in our society. But we want to isolate ourselves and then find a new friend until we find things wrong with them. The Bible calls what God has called us into the Greek word for it is koinonia, and it means fellowship. And it means fellowship, being together in each other's presence in the Holy Spirit. It's deep. It's great. It's sharing. I believe that the future church is going to have a, the front door is going to be, people are going to find us online, are going to listen, you know, go to our website and do all this. But I believe the back door is going to be fellowship. I be, believe the people who are going to get touched and want to grow in Jesus are going to come and be in each other's presence. That's what I think it's all about. Think about it. All of the gifts of the Spirit that take place take place in each other's presence, praying for one another. Paul said, the gift was imparted to you through the laying on of hands, not from a thousand miles away across the Internet. It's going to be done in presence with each other. Think about all your favorite sports. Think if they just sat home and played it on the computer with each other. Doesn't work. They got to hit one another. They got to make contact. They got to get physical. That's what makes it work. But these guys at the bowling alley have no idea how this works. It's up to us to start showing them how it works. It's up to us to show them. Having a bad day? It's okay. It's okay. I'm not going to yell at you for it. You know, it's like, take it easy. What can I do for you? It's up to us to show them how to do that. But, but while we're learning with each other and we're stumbling and, we, and I make a mistake and you say it's okay, the enemy wants to come to divide us. He wants to come to divide us. And he wants to put thoughts into our, into our head. And we, we, we make it worse by, by ignoring God's word and God's principles. We have, we have parents that are not teaching their kids parent, uh, good character anymore. And we have all these bad reactions. And if you just look at just exactly what love means itself, it just says that it's patient. I don't like patience. I really don't like it. I really love to react to things that bother me immediately. It's, really, it, it's very self-gratifying to me. Somebody pulls out in front of me, I wish I could shoot him with a paintball gun. <laughs> or worse, maybe a 22 bullet in a rear tire would be really good. I, it would make me feel good, I think. I think. I've never tried it, so I can't really tell you, but it seems like. But if you read it's not jealous, it doesn't brag, it's not arrogant, it doesn't seek its own, it's not provoked. You ever been provoked by anybody in here? Uh-huh. So I thought. Not taken into account. A wrong suffered, not rejoicing, rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures. Wow. Proverbs, Proverbs says that if God loves you, it's in Proverbs 3, 8. It said 3, um, 3, 8 through 11, I think. Um, he's looking at me. Proverbs 3, 11. Um, it says that if God loves you, he's going to discipline you. <gasps> Okay, need to realize here that not, the word discipline doesn't necessarily talk about punishment. Discipline is learning how to have discipline so that you can do the things that are right to do and not make the wrong decisions. And God teaches us discipline because he loves us because he wants us to learn how to have relationships so we can really have a full, loving, happy life. And he wants us, so he sends Kurt into my life. Kurt, would it be a regular Sunday if I didn't pick on you once or something? One day, if, you have, if you're married to your wife, you get into debt, and then you walk out the door, door and, and, and 
do what you want. <laughs> okay, that's, um, yeah. That's why Kurt doesn't share from the pulpit. Um, but what I thought Kurt was going to say was that a man could be a fool and not know it unless he's married. His wife will tell him, right. Thank you. Okay, anyway. The church is where we learn about the body of Christ. And the body of Christ needs each part. Now, Paul was very clear about this, and we make it so spiritual and so pretty and everything, but the fact of the matter is that your body is made up of a lot of parts, some of which you don't really appreciate. Okay? I'm not fond of my colon, but I need it really bad. <laughs> got to have it. I might use a different word in the duck blind, but you, you got to have it. Okay? But to give, you, to give you another example, like my right shoulder, I've dislocated it, I don't know how many times. And I've had surgery on it, and it still bothers me. And, and every once in a while I forget, and I'll lift up a carton of paper or something, I'll throw it up on my shoulder, and then it starts moving around and everything. And then when I, and I say, oh, it's too late, because for the next three or four days, it's going to just ache and ache and ache. But I'm not going to cut it off, because I do a lot of things with my right arm. It may bother me, and it may give me trouble, but I'm not cutting it off. You can't just cut somebody off that God has placed into your life. He wants to teach them, teach you how to consider every part of the body is a part that you need. Let me do, I'm just going to throw a few things in closing, some suggestion, relationship suggestions. Did I skip over that one story, honey, that I was going to tell about you that was really, really funny? I was, she said, I hope so. We had this discussion this week. She calls me up on the phone. I'm in my truck. And she calls me on the phone and she said, did you pay the mortgage this month? So I'm confused right away because she's the one that writes out the checks and pays the bills. So I'm like, why is she asking me if I paid the mortgage? Now, I'm a guy and I have this really bad problem that I actually take literally every word that's said to me. Like if you use the word refrigerator, I'm assuming you're talking about the refrigerator. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not thinking it's just a general appliance term. Okay, I understand that that's not the language that women like to speak. So, okay, I got the general drift that there's a problem. So I said, what do you mean, did I pay the mortgage? Well, you know, we're like, I don't even know if she was saying like we're a month late or something. I said, well, no, it's September. So I said, so you paid the September 1st mortgage? Yeah, we paid that one. Okay, so you concerned about October one? No, I think we missed one. Which one do you think we missed? We missed November? She goes, no, you're not getting it. I said, well, right. I am not getting it at all. I have no idea what you're talking about. And so I raised my voice a little bit. She goes, you don't have to get upset with me. I'm like, right. But this is really hard because I have no idea what she's talking about. Five minutes go by. We both give up. And she goes, forget it. I can't make myself clear. I went, apparently, because I have no idea what you said. We're going to be married 43 years, like in a week and a half, right? Or is it next week? October 1st. Yeah, a week and a half. It's like, you see what I'm saying? It's like, it doesn't go smooth. But God wants us to work it out. He doesn't want, he doesn't want me to have to have four guys sitting on my back waiting for me to calm down. He wants me to work, work this thing out. So let me just give you some, some um, relationship, the things that you missed this works for friends as well as marriages. It works for everybody. But things that they should have had a test on is that, number one, number one, you need blinders in your life. Put blinders on horses so they don't get distracted. We need blinders when it comes to relationships because we all have problems. Please come to grips with the fact that you have problems. It's not everybody else. You have problems. We all do. And when we relate to one another... I am going to turn a blind eye to your problems and I'm going to concentrate on your strengths. And as soon as you do the other, the relationship will begin to go downhill. And that leads to the second one. That leads to the second one. Don't try to change anyone. 
First thing, I've said it before, I'll say it again. First thing I say in the very first meeting with a couple that wants to get married, and by the way, that's why Linda and I sit down with people because we would like to give them a written test before we marry them instead of just doing it. But we sit down with them. The very first thing I say to, to the woman is there are things about your man that you want to change. And they never argue with me. And I say, from this moment on, don't love him the way he is. He's never going to change. If you can come to grips with that, you have a chance. And she's like, so we get to that point. And then I say to the guy, there are things about your wife that's going to change. Come to grips with it. It's going to happen. But the point here is, don't try to change anybody. Let God do the work. God is really good at changing people. Let him do it. He is really good at it. Whenever I've gotten in the way and tried to make something happen like that, it hasn't worked. It's almost always been bad. And that leads to the next one. You can try to get in the middle of other people's problems and you can be, and you can be the one that suffers for it. You've, many, you've all heard of what a log jam is. Do you know what a log jam is? If you're really young, maybe not. But in the old days, they used to cut down trees, and because they didn't have a really good way of getting them from one place to another, they would literally float the logs down the river. And there's a river up in the Adirondacks that's called Indian Lake because 120 years ago, the company that owned the land just built a dam there. Can you imagine them trying to do that today? And they just simply built a dam, flooded this whole river valley into a big lake that's about a mile wide, and they cut all the trees down, and the trees would just float down this, this big lake to the, to the end where they could load them up. And they'd have to go over this dam. They'd open up this thing in the dam, and then they'd have to go down the river farther. And that's the easiest way to get the logs down the mountain. But every once in a while, the logs would get jammed. One would get in the way, and it would stop all the logs from going down the river. And you can imagine the weight that was on that. And so they would get this log jammer out there who would literally, with, with poles and everything, levers, and find a walking on the logs, which is what that contest is all about today. That's what they're from. These guys were experts at walking on logs and so forth. Then when we were in the Adirondack Museum watching that, they also had this big mask, because back then they didn't have scuba deer, that they would put on people that they could actually look in the water between the logs was made out of metal so it wouldn't get crushed with glass on it so they could find the log jammer that got lost under the logs and died. Because one slip and he's gone and he can't get up because the logs are in his way. So you need a log jammer to undo some of the jams that we have in relationships. And that log jammer is the Holy Spirit. That log jammer is the Holy Spirit. I used to think that in a multitude of words, we can just talk this thing out, and I've seen the logs jam farther and farther and farther. You need the log jammer in your life. Number four, in relationships, encourage, 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 and encourage. You can't have enough of it. Keep encouraging one another. There's nothing like encouragement in the scriptures principally. There's nothing like it. It's great. Number five. Did I say number five before? Number four or five. Number five. Love languages. Okay, guys hate that word. Um, what would you say besides love languages for a guy? But it would be the kind of language that makes other people feel better. And there's different ways, different things that we appreciate that other people don't. What makes me feel better doesn't necessarily work for Linda doesn't work for Linda. So if I'm thinking, well, this is what I would like. So here's what I did one time. When I was a kid, I was about 13 years old, and it was my mother's birthday. I went out and I bought her a box of tools. <laughs> because that would have made me very happy. And didn't make her happy at all. We do this in relationships all the time. Learn what the other person likes. Six, respect Everybody. Respect everybody. I don't really care who they are, where they're from, what they've done. It doesn't really matter. Every person is a child of God, and God has not given us the right to look down on anyone. Respect people. Respect them. Number seven, learn to listen to people. 
That is really the hard part for me. I have a really hard... We took a course. <laughs> we took a course, Dale Carnegie course. He had to take a test on how you're listening. I flunked. I flunked the test. But so did Linda. So we flunked. Hi. We flunked the test for different reasons. But you can't really relate to people if you're not hearing them. Learn it. Figure out why you're doing it. Whatever it's ADD or you're thinking about what you're going to say or, or you're bored with their say. Whatever it is, get over it and learn to listen to other people. And then the last one I'm going to throw at you is if you, any relationship to make it work, you have to give of yourself to the other person. You have to give, give, give to them. You have to bless them. You have to spend time with them. You have to be generous. You have to share. You have to give yourself. You're going to, you're going to reap from that relationship what you put into it. It's just the way it is. So I'm just telling you right now, folks, like this place, there's going to be problems between us. There's probably already people here you don't even like. Get over it. God's put you here for them, them for you. God wants to form a family here so that we can go out and we can start touching those people that are literally fighting, physically fighting with each other, or not talking to another, or ma marriages that are breaking up. It, that's, that's what hurts God. The hurt that, that, it's, that goes on in relationships is the thing that hurts God. Not having somebody say the word colon from the pulpit. <laughs> if that hurt you, get over it. It's the relationships. If you've been pulling yourself back, if you've been like, I'm not, I don't like that person, or whatever is going on, please, let God, the Holy Spirit, start working in your hearts today and let him pull you towards himself so that you can give yourself to other people. And we're going to pray for you. The laying on of hands, prophetic word, and words of wisdom are available here for us to learn together. Lord Jesus, we just, we just pray that you would do the work that you want to do in us so that we can go out into the world, into the bowling alleys, into the bars, into wherever it is we're at in the schools, in our workplace, and we can be the one to bring peace and to teach people how to relate to one another. And we can teach them that church is a place where we learn this because it's not just some place to go because we believe, but we have come here to learn the things about God. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name.